Welcome, aloha. Thanks for joining us at Think Tank Hawaii. And a little reminder, this is fundraising time of the year. We completely depend on you folks for support and subsistence and sustainability. So if you log on to Think Tank Hawaii and are so moved, all the help of any kind and any amount is greatly appreciated. <laughs> As a wise man once said, the best nation is a donation. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that wise man, Chuck? <laughs> Today we're going to explore what have we seen so far in 2023 that may give us some idea of what we're looking at coming up in 2024, a big election year. Okay. And we have with us today the Professor Emeritus from the University of Dayton School of Law, visiting professor at Washington and Lee School of Law, and French Order of the Golden Palm awardee, Ben Davis, and former chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution. So Ben has worn many hats in his years. Um, some of them apparently took with him some of his hairline, but he still yeah. has enough of it left to be able to brag about. We also have with us Tim Avicella. <clears throat> Tim is moving toward dual citizenship. <clears throat> the great theory that Mark Twain and others have reminded us, always leave yourself an exit yeah. <laughs> if you need one. Hopefully we won't. So today we're going to explore... <laughs> What have we seen so far in 2023 that gives us any idea of what might be out there in 2024 in the way of choices and directions? Ben, you want to start us off? What have you seen so far? So, um, well, well I'll, maybe I'll speak about a couple things. First is, uh, so I, I had COVID at a super spreader event last uh, uh, last Sunday, uh, a week ago, my, my 50th reunion, uh, where apparently 12 people have gotten COVID. So I think we should keep in mind that uh, COVID is still around. And so if you're not vaccinated or not boosted, get there. And that Paxlovid is what I took on the Monday. And by Friday, I went negative. I, this stuff was magical. So... We, I think uh, our friend COVID and its various mutations is something that's going to be around. And how the CDC deals with it and copes with it, I think, will be something that will be in the, in the air, so to speak, for uh, uh, this period that's coming up. The second thing that I was going to speak about is, um, and again, I'm, 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 it's hard to predict, but um, I've been kind of involved last couple, three weeks with uh, some developments in Ohio, where there's been an effort to put in place what I call miseducation bills, uh, which are trying to uh, basically uh, create these indoctrination centers at the university where I used to teach the, in right-wing ideology, and uh, also uh, ban DEI, uh, there is also a, you know, there's going to be a constitu Ohio constitutional amendment on the, uh, on the uh, uh, ballot in November. And so the Ohio uh, legislature has passed a rule that it has to pass not by majority like it's been for 100 years, but by 60 percent to be adopted. And that's going up for being considered at a special election. The reason I'm saying about all this stuff in Ohio is I'm noticing a distinct mobilization going on by people against these things, opposing these things. Uh, in the Ohio legislature, you know, uh, civil society type people and things like that. And I just find that kind of interesting because people have been saying for a long time Ohio is kind of a red state, right? My sense is that, well, it may not be as red as people thought it was when it comes for this uh, next 2024 period. And uh, so that's the thing that I'm kind of looking at as, a, as an interesting development. So I, those would be the two things I'd point out. Uh, thanks, Ben. And for reminding us 
<laughs> on the one hand, I mean, as Professor Emeritus from the University of Toledo School of Law, Ben Davis leaves and Ohio just goes to hell in a handbasket. But <laughs> but there's there's a wave of resistance. So you have apparently left <laughs> some successors that are still fighting the good fight. <laughs> and also for reminding us that there's a lot of toxic stuff out there, including COVID. So exercise wisdom, judgment, discretion, and restraint. And when it's appropriate, if you're on a long flight or you're in an enclosed area in close quarters with people for an extended period, hey, use your head, use your mask. Yeah, absolutely. It, a small price to pay for as much as people may be belittle it for what has apparently proven to be some measure of mitigation. Yeah. So, exactly. Tim, what have you seen so far in 2023 that it gives you some sense of what might be out there for 2024 and where it might go? Well, being um, defined as somewhat cynical, uh, I see hope. What I saw in 2023s was hope. And what was that hope? I saw some diminishment of Donald Trump's influence and power, uh, certainly from last year's midterm elections, but more so what recently occurred in the negotiations on the debt ceiling limit between Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden. Uh, if you recall, Kevin McCarthy was nothing more than a, a, a lapdog for Donald Trump. Whatever Trump caught him about, Kevin McCarthy was there to follow his instructions to the T. Uh, that didn't happen here in these negotiations. We heard on the CNN town hall meeting that Donald Trump thought that uh, the United States should default on its debt, a, ca a cataclysmic event that would occur and forever change our economy and probably part of the world's economy. Uh, that didn't happen because Kevin McCarthy, in this case, Speaker of the House, was his own boss. He wasn't following strict orders from Donald Trump. And look what they came up with. They came up with a solution. It appears we will not default on the debt. And um, I applaud Kevin McCarthy, which I can't imagine doing. So um, I saw hope that occurred this year. And I think we'll continue to see the dim diminishment of influence that Donald Trump thinks he owns and will continue to try to pull off. But I think his best days are over. Well, and we have the advent of Chris Christie into the uh, Republican presidential candidacies. And that's certainly not going to uh, provide a voice that has anything particularly good to say about uh, the former president. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, Christie is no wallflower. <laughs> no. So I, I expect a mix up in 2024 and a fairly. Um, Energetic one at that. That would yeah. be an interesting debate. Oh, it'll well, happen beyond the debates. It'll be, uh, it'll be, uh, you know, in several news headlines. Chrissy says this. Trump responds. Uh, you know, it's going to go back and forth. It, you know, it's it's perfect for the media. They love that kind of stuff. Yeah, just to, to jump on that, um, I thought I saw something really interesting with uh, Ron DeSantis uh, being called out about some school board down in uh, Florida that was uh, banning or maybe making only available to certain age kids this poem uh, done by the poet who spoke at the uh, inauguration, right? Yeah, Amanda Gorman. Right. Amanda Gorman, right? So this young poet, like 23, right, who I think is from Florida, and she had the best line I ever saw. It said, it's amazing that one family who turns out to be kind of associated with the uh, Oath Keepers, by the way, can get my poem banned, but this entire country can't get guns banned, you know, to protect kids. But when DeSantis was called out on this, he said, it wasn't me. You know, was it, that reminded me of that song, you know, where the, the guys is... Uh, where are you doing this? Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Hey, man, wait a minute. Did you pass the law? Wasn't me. What are you, aren't you talking anti-woke? Wasn't me. You know, I mean, it was caught in this contradiction. I thought that was a nice, beautiful moment in Iowa to see the guy having, you know, 
payback that's happened. If I may, uh, Ben, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, isn't it odd that DeSantis very early on, especially before he announced, uh, got what we would call in the Pacific Northwest, the Seattle area, his nose got a little ahead of his ski tips. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I don't know if he knows how to rein that back. I don't know if it's in his personality to rein back um, his distinct aspects of his personality. Um, I know he's carefully scripted and they caught him off, you know, off guard at one of his rallies here and uh, was very insulting, but um, maybe he's not Donald Trump 2.0 and maybe that's his issue. Yeah, I think, I just think he's too young. I mean, he's, uh, he's 44 and uh, he doesn't have enough uh, uh, experience behind him to be able to handle the entire country. I mean, he's got a very friendly legislature down there in Ohio, in, uh, sorry, in Florida that would do his bidding. But in the rough and tumble, that's D.C., where I think the, the old joke was, you want a friend in D.C., get a dog. You know, that, you know he, his game is going to be much, much harder, much, much harder. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's over his skis. And uh, and it's good for him because, you know, with the stuff that he passed, like the six week abortion ban thing, which is actually just an abortion ban, since right. a lot of women don't even know they're pregnant at six weeks. Um, you know, it's just he's got to, you know, he, he should catch some hell. I mean, I'd be happy for him to really get caught by a lot of comments and questions. And but it, I, I have to hope, however, that the actual uh, reporters are willing to play that hard game. Because it seems like a lot of times the reporters are not as tough as I think I used to remember some of them being back when the Nixon days and things like that, you know. It's like that access access reporting where you get access to somebody so you kind of do a softball interview with them. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, I saw this guy from CNBC do an interview with Elon Musk and he looked like he was starstruck because he's with the, you know, the richest man in the world. You know, say, hey, so what? The richest man in the world uh, can still be a bonehead, you know? Well, I think you've hit a spot on with the media and it's reporting or it's lack thereof. Um, yeah, I've got the golden ticket for the interview to be in the, in the ring to ask questions. So I better uh, softball the questions or I won't be invited back. And that's a huge uh, deterrent for good journalism. Yeah. And the question is, how do we get rid of the invitation for journalists to attend? Well, yeah. And, you know, you wonder up the chain of command in the in the corporate settings of these. Uh, if, if uh, you know, journalists are being uh, kind of discouraged from being tough, you know, because of rating, you know, the old rating thing, you know, that that won't work for you. Um, I've been, you know, it, it, it really you, you feel like there's just been this kind of softening of the aggressiveness of the fifth estate um, more generally. And, you know, you can go out, look at democracy now or something like that, but they're not going to get these people to come on their, on their show. Uh, um, you know, the town hall by Trump is an example. It's like, I mean, she was doing a hell of a job, you know, because the guy lies every 15 seconds, right? But, you know, it's still just the way it was all set up with the uh, so-called... Uh, undecided who obviously had been handpicked to be all kind of pro trumpers you know it was just like that was like silly in a way but you know well, it, it, lo it looked horribly orchestrated as far as uh, those who were in the audience and um certainly wasn't a bright day for cnn yet although i was highly critical of the town meeting it has turned out that donald trump in many ways self-incriminated himself and yes. that may well come against him when it comes to um, Mr. Smith's uh, desire to uh, indict him for the document issues. Yeah, yeah. So that that gets me uh, to another thing about these investigations that go on in the Department of Justice. You know, there's a, there's a old phrase I learned from some military people, which was along the lines of different spanks for different ranks, right? You know, <laughs> uh, there's another version of that, which is manure, manure, but it's not the word manure goes downhill. Okay. And, uh, and so I, 
when you're down, so the way it kind of plays out is that if something happens, it's like misfeasance at the bottom, no, malfeasance at the bottom, misfeasance at the top. I made a mistake or mistakes were made. They wouldn't even admit that they made the mistake. It was just mistakes were made. And so when you get these uh, hopes up about a Department of Justice actual prosecution, you know, because the investigation seems terribly obvious. I, you know, it's just like, I'm like, is Jack Smith really going to be the one who's going to pull the trigger? Or is Merrick Garland really going to be the one who's going to okay Jack Smith going ahead? Or is it going to be that thing where it somehow it doesn't happen? I mean, I saw during the torture stuff, right, all during that, that, the attorney general did everything, whether it was Mukasey or whatever the other one was, to avoid going up the chain of command. You know, you had those soldiers that Abu Ghraib got court-martialed, right? You had their their general got administratively reduced to uh, colonel, okay? But all the people put in place the 54-country torture regime, the CIA types, all that stuff, not one of them ultimately got prosecuted, even though there are lots of investigations that happened, you know. And so that's the thing that worries me, is that we, we hear a lot of noise, and maybe it's true or not, that Jack Smith has the good, especially on the documents thing. I mean, my goodness, that like looks like a slam dunk to me. But, you know, you got the January 6th, in low-level folk malfeasance, they're getting prosecuted. They're going to jail. Even this guy from uh, Oath Keepers got 18 years, right? I mean, you know, that's some serious stuff happening. But once you start to go to, the, quote, unquote, the suits above, you know, you, you, you see that all of a sudden, it you know, the delay, 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 you know. Now, one trip, one thing that's interesting right now is that you have the prosecution in state court in New York that's going on on those um, the, on those uh, campaign finance felonies, 34 felonies and all that. And then that's interesting. Um, Trump's people have just tried to get it removed from state court to federal court. And this is basically an old game where you, when a state prosecutor goes after sort of a current or federal official they can try to get it removed to federal court because the federal court takes a look to see whether this was within their official duties. And if the federal court concludes it's within its official duties, it basically kills the criminal investigation. And that's the game that Trump is trying to play there to say that everything he was doing was within his official duties. So therefore, you know, federal court quashed the, the state compl uh, criminal complaint. There is the battle about that that's going to go on in that federal court. We'll see how that plays. But then the other one is looking down at uh, Georgia, right? As the state prosecutor in Fulton County there. And then, you know, they get in place this commission from the uh, governor that's supposed to be able to remove prosecutors. You know, I'm like, the game, you know, the moving pieces in these games sometimes are so twisted. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of appalling. So, you, you know, you hope that there'll be some accountability, really meaningful accountability for all these people who've been doing all this awful stuff. But I just don't know. I just don't know, you know, if we're capable of really doing that, you know? Well, what I find interesting is, you know, we've witnessed for the last five years the slow march, very slow march, well, in some cases accelerated, march to autocracy in our, in our form of government. And, by our leader, leader, and uh, the, his staff. Um, the question is, yeah, that was looked like it was happening on a federal level, but very quietly, very slowly, we're seeing autocracy being implemented on the state level. Yeah, um, and certainly things that would look very much like an autocracy or a fascist state that happened in Florida about banning books and uh, what you, will, what will not be tolerated in schools, words you can't say, and oh, a host of things. So. The cynic part of me starts to come out again uh, yeah. that takes notice of this and says, how do we reverse this? How do we get back to where it's out of favor, it's out of fashion to be a good old fashioned fascist? And right. I, I, I don't think we're there yet. And, and Chuck, you know, maybe this is where media comes in for 2024. 
is um, I hate to say it, but it's the scarlet letter thing. It's it's the uh, the shame uh, designation that one should own and wear when they're acting like little fascists. Well, and we'll see whether media steps up or not. But yeah. Am I being too hard by using that word, by the way? Am I no, am I exaggerating I think, what I'm, I'm sensing in the last five years? No, I, I, I think you're exactly right. And the thing that's really bothered me is uh, the acquiescence of people to this. You know, it's like the go along to get along mentality that, uh, well, you know, who's ever the boss is, you know, is saying this is the way to go. And so, OK, I'm going to go with what the boss says, even though, you know, you know and and. This kind of uh, false security, I think people have that think the strong man, the magical strong person, is going to, you know, solve all their problems. Um, there's 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 a streak in Americans that is, and in other countries too, but in Americans, I, that streak has been strong for. I mean, this cult of what thirty percent of the Republicans who live and die by what Trump does. I'm like, I mean, what does a guy have to do for people to say, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, that's enough. You know what I mean? I mean, really. But, the, you know, this kind of fascinating... Uh, I would say another thing is that, you know, th we have the cult of money in the United States, which is that if you're making a lot of money or you're so-called billionaire, you know, you're supposed to be, quote-unquote, smarter than all the rest of us, and they must know something and all that stuff. And so I think he gets a certain amount of credibility as do others like Elon Musk and all that because they're on a pile of money, right? But as in terms of actually running a country, you know, I got to give some credit to Joe Biden for the efforts that have been put in to go towards the middle class, go towards the working class, get money in their pockets. Um, I, you know, I saw a number recently where it's like the unemployment rate was three and a half percent or something. And I was like, shocked. That's a number I haven't seen since the 60s, I think. And, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember those kind of numbers for unemployment. And I was like, that's amazing, you know, mm -hmm. that, 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 and that there's pressure for, for uh, wages to rise. I said, that's great. On the other hand, you know, in this kind of Democrat-Republican kind of donor class protection, you know, Apparently, 40% of the inflation happening is because of price gouging, basically, where co companies have said to their, their, uh, their uh, uh, shareholders, because you can't lie on those shareholder calls. Man. The shareholder calls, they don't, they don't play. You know, they'll, they'll go after you in a second with a, <laughs> a case, you know, as a materially, you know, not revealing some material fact. So, you know, they, they're, they're, they're saying, you know, we've got price power. We've got price power. And we've exercised it to increase our mark or increase our profit mark, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no real strong sort of, I don't know if it's antitrust or FTC or even state level calling out that, you know, the, to really cause those people in the C-suite to kind of think twice about that increase, you know. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd like to ask you something since your career has been based in education. And, you know, we were talking, you were talking earlier about, you know, how this slow move to fascism or, you know, autocracy is, is being missed. And I guess from an education standpoint, do you think that is a direct result of our lack of teaching civics early on and, and throughout junior high and high school? that the, 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 the amount of ignorance that Americans have about their own government, how it works, how it should work, how it was formed in the first place, what were the ideas uh, that formed this, this government? Um, do you think we've lost that? And, and that's why they, to quote jo, uh, Joni Mitchell in, in Yellow Taxi, you don't know what it's gone until it's yeah. gone. Right, right. You know, yeah. you know I mean? You so know, they don't know what they're, they don't know what democracy really is, so they don't know when it's going away. Yeah, no, I, you know, when you think about the, the diversification of ed education in this country, right? there's the public schools, then there's the chartered schools, then there's the private schools, and then there's the homeschooling, you know, that are these different parts. I don't know what the percentages are of each of them, but, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting mix. And then the question is, what is the content of what's being taught in each of those? Like, you know, there was social studies, which maybe kind of took on the role of civics. But then as, as 
there have been kind of this dumbing down thing going on in terms of the the educational system. That's been one of the worries I had about what was going on in Ohio because it was not only dumbing down, but it was actually trying to indoctrinate with one view of everything that's there. You know, I don't know if you remember when you were a kid in school, they said that, you know, was it George Washington could never lie? And, you know, he cut down the cherry tree, right? You know, that I remember that kind of stuff as being, you know, like... I cannot God, tell a lie. <laughs> right, right. You know, and I, you know, being the gospel that I learned, you know, and I'd hope that by today, you know, we would have figured out, well, actually, you know, it's a little more complicated than that. But I'm saying, you know, the level, the level of the student, it varies, right? You know, but, but what I'm trying to say is that we, we get a sense of the, the richness, the complexity of it, you know? I, you know, that's one of the things, like one of the things that I, I learned down here in uh, Virginia, I went out to James Madison's plantation, right? And they had a tour. And they told me that in 1824, the Marquis de Lafayette was kind of doing a grand tour around the country, you know, remembering the good old days of the revolution, right? So he goes to James Madison's place and proceeds to castigate Madison for not having freed his enslaved people, you know? That's not something I, I just learned that a year ago. Or, you know, I, that would have been an interesting to, part of the Marquis de Lafayette story that I thought would have been give some, you know, some some aspects of what's going on, you know. Well, th that you've hit it right there is, you know, shining a light on a history that none of us were taught uh, now is woke and now right. has been associated with a negative connotation of liberal. Uh, so anything liberal, woke, or Democrat is all in the same basket. Therefore, don't shine a light on anything that might make us look bad. Right. And, and, and I've heard the comment made that, you know, if you can't deal with your bad history as a country, you have a problem. You know, one of the things that I heard about in the late early 60s or so, for example, in Germany, you had all these kids who were teenagers who were asking their parents, what did you do during the war? Because the parents have been silent about what they've done under the Nazis. And it created this huge shock in Germany uh, of a uh, student rebellion and all that, because these kids all learned, you know, their parents were supporting Hitler back in the day. And it was like, you know, contradiction in their head. You know? But there's been such an effort in a country like, like that to, to, to know the history. To understand it, you know, and to and to and to, to 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 move forward, integrating all that stuff. That you know, this is how bad we can be. You know what I mean? This is how bad we can be, but this is how good we can be too. You know that kind of thing. Uh, but I don't know. You know, it's yeah. I I I find that there. You know, is there a solution in twenty twenty four? Well, you know, it's like. You know, that's that thing about the for the American dream, you have to be sleeping, right? You know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's I've heard that comment. I said, you, you know, it's true. We, you don't have to be woke. You just have to be awake, you know, and, and, and be willing, you know, be willing to hear something, you know, you know, just to be willing to, to, to have, you know, because there's so much, so many false narratives, right? I mean, we're good. It's amazing. Like, I just saw something where they were saying that, you know, that Brian Sicknick, who was killed. Uh, in the Capitol riot, there's, you know, these folks on the right are saying that he was actually killed by the D.C. police. You know what I mean? I mean, I said, come on, man. I mean, really? Really, people? Yeah, you're going to throw that stuff out there? It's insane. Anyway, so, hope straight is eternal. Uh, mm -hmm. Before we leave, I, I've got to say that the quote of the day is, you don't have to be woke, you just have to be awake. Yeah, I agree. That's the quote of the day, Ben. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, that's just okay. random coming out of where. Who knows? You know, good and, place. <laughs> and in our last minute, any last thoughts you want to leave us with, Ben? I, I would just say that I I want to encourage people to be active in whatever way that you can. It might be. If there's some legislation, testifying, it might be going out and demonstrating like with the poor people's campaign when they do something. I don't know what it, it might be sending 10 bucks to somebody. I don't know what it is, but just don't sit back because there are people working real hard, especially very rich donors, to keep their sinecure. And you, if you want this place to be the kind of America that you've always hoped it would be in the 21st century, 
we got to kind of fight for it a little bit. Tim, any last thoughts? Yeah, last thought is, as we come to a 2024, we're going to have an election next year. Um, let's remind ourselves, be it Gen Z, be it um, millennials, be it baby boom, baby bust generations. Let's remind ourselves what it took to make this country a great country, and that is its government of democracy. And though we change parties, we do so with the freedom to say goodbye. You've served your term. Uh, you're done. Rather than... Um, captivating the office for years and years to come or would be hopeful to capture the office for years to come. And I would write everybody of how we got here with the form of government that we have. And I wish people would pay more attention to that. Ben, Tim, thank you so much. And thank all of you for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii <clears throat> and for reminding us the message is stand up, speak up, speak out. Another great quote for what you believe. There we go. With Aloha, see you all again. Thanks from Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.